Hello grade 11 grammatic arts learners. My name is Lance Lai August and this is the second part of um, our lesson on um, South African theatre. So remember I am taking you through a journey of South African theatre as per the grade 11 CAPS dramatic arts curriculum. In the first um, session we did a bit of a historical overview and today we are going specifically into spaces. Um, let me just share my presentation with you so that you can uh, exactly see what I am on about. There it is. Um, you should be able to see it, I think. OK, it seems that you can see it now. Um, uh, we are doing a section on um, <coughs> dramatic arts, uh, South African theatre spaces. In the last session, we um, I gave you a bit of a context as to South African theatre, what it is about, um, and the indigenous theatre forms that has led to what we know as theatre and performance today. We then went through a genealogy or a chronological overview of South African theatre from the period 6000 before Common Era to the 1990s. And we started off by uh, explaining the, how the Khoisan tribes contributed towards theater. And then we went to the Nguni tribes during the Iron Age. Um, then we looked at uh, the onset of colonialism in South Africa in 1652 with the arrival of Jan van Riebeek and the Dutch East India Company. From that point onwards in the 1700s, we looked at French settlers in the Cape. And then after that, we looked at um, the British invasion in the Cape in the 1800s. And then in the 1900s, we looked at the rise of Afrikaner nationalism and how that contributed towards the creation of, of Afrikaans theatre. We then also looked at 1920s and the era of drama in education, followed by um, the onset of apartheid and what that meant for theatre. And we also looked at the 1960s and what happened with regards to British equity boycotts and the establishment of performing arts councils, which reigned until the early 1990s. Um, we looked at the 1970s Black Consciousness Theatre Movement. Um, we looked at the 1980s Agit Proper Protest Theatre Movement. And in the 1990s, we moved towards a theatre for reconciliation and also theatre which fused art forms. In today's session, I'll be looking at uh, giving you an introduction to what a the theatrical space is, how it is made up and things like that and then also uh, the different kinds of theatre spaces that, that exist. So without any further ado, let's get into it. So um, let me just bring up all my points uh, before I explain to you what it is. <coughs> so essentially, theatrical space is, is the space within uh, which we perform. It's a space in which the audience and the performers get to share an experience and um, uh, uh, theatre or space is an, is, is an essential element for a performer, um, uh, it's an essential element for the audience and because it's a space within which they meet. Um, a space could never be empty, it may appear so, but in fact it's always crowded with memories, with political, with religious and cosmolog cosmological significance. So even if a space is empty, there is something that fills that particular space. And you notice it because you feel a particular way when you enter a particular space. So space in theatre is very complex, uh, particularly when you consider the history of South Africa. Space has been fought for over in time and it's been moulded by power dynamics and power relationships. like. Who owns the space? Who is allowed into the space? Who is the space designed to keep out? All of these are, are crucial questions when you look at what space is. The acting space, whether it is a village or an opera house, is, is a space where there is a possibility for transformation. When one enters a theatrical space, new rules apply and anything can happen. And there's a socially agreed upon contract or boundary that marks out the performance space as a, some sort of magical realm, as a uh, area that is full of potency, that is full of potential. And the space itself may create a boundary where actors may demarcate their space by pretending the audience is not there, 
or by engaging with the audience directly as we um, see in the onset of Epic Theatre and Brecht that you were learning in grade 12. Um, for example, in Western theatre, the contract uh, between the spectator and the performer has already been agreed upon. There are certain expectations of an audience. When one walks into the theatre, some of these may be silence, focused concentration on the action with applause at the end as a sort of acknowledgement for what um, the performers in the space do. Audiences uh, agree to this knowing that um, they uh, will then be transported and, 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 and entertained through um, the actor's artistry. So let me just get to uh, the next slide. Um, yeah, so that is basically what a theatrical space is. You see how space is made up, um, what, what sort of rules govern a space, you know that space is political. And at this stage, I just want you to perhaps uh, reflect by doing an activity, <coughs> list the ways in which a space can be made a performance space, either by the aspects of the space itself or by the actor and the audience. Just reflect on that and write it down in a journal somewhere so that you can understand for yourself what a space is and draw on your experience of stage spaces that you learned in grade 10, theater in the round, proscenium arch, etc. That is what it refers to. And then we will go into uh, what different kinds of performance spaces are. I'll only be doing three with you today, which is African traditional performance spaces, circular performance spaces, and then I think university performance spaces and Engl and, and, and Western style buildings as performance spaces. So uh, we'll first look at um, um, traditional rural South African performance spaces. Um, traditional African uh, performances use open spaces rather than formal theater buildings. And this has led to many um, um, errors to sort of discount uh, African traditional and dramatic forms, believing that theater didn't exist in an African society. But if one looks deeper, one realizes um, that while a building might not exist, the space has been specifically marked out for a performance through a contract between um, audiences and actors. Different spaces are used depending on the social position of the performer and the purpose of the performance. For example, when an old woman um, performs stories, the performance is most likely to take place inside of the hut. While when men and boys perform, they will perform in a courtyard where historical uh, performances take place. And then also because traditional rural South African customs and traditions were synonymous with hunting um, to, gather, to gather food, hunters also had stories to tell. So hunters may come together um, in open spaces and tell their stories. <coughs> so while the spatial arrangements of the performance space may vary, often they use a circular form as this allows for maximum involvement from the audience. And at times there may be like a painted or other kind of backdrop, in which case the space is usually three-sided. And then in some rituals or um, groups move from, from, from one space to another. So if I can give you an example, I think of a Siswati Thanksgiving ritual or Inwala, which has various stages, including a regimental um, parade be before the king. And while the ceremony is not a drama, it certainly has dramatic features, including the use of spectacle, the use of music, the use of dance, the use of actors, where the main role is obviously being taken by the king himself. And then, of course, the, the use of space for the ritual is... Um, demonstrated in a, in a picture that I'm going to show you in the next uh, slide. Let me just go to that slide. That is the circular performance space. I took it from the Grade 11 Dramatic Arts textbook. So basically, <coughs> this kind of space could be easily adapted for literary dramas in the Siswati language or any African language for that matter. Um, this uh, circular performance style is what um, possibly give a dramas the uniquely African flair, and this also allows for a, a potential or increased interaction between uh, the actors and the audiences. So of course, um, some uh, dramatic forms taking place in um, open performance spaces uh, uh, um, include praise uh, performances, 
Um, also folk storytelling, which is a mode of storytelling where act, a single actor assumes the roles of the different characters. Then you also have Zionist church services that also take place in such form of uh, performance space. And all of these modes have highly developed dramatic elements, which include music, which include singing, dancing, improvisation, and of course, ritualistic um, symbolic aspects. That's the end of that. And now we'll move on to our next kind of performance space, which are um, Western style theater buildings. So during the late 19th century, many theater buildings were erected uh, in rapidly growing cities. These theaters copied the latest European trends of the period, um, including a gas lighting, boxes for important theater goers and galleries, um, uh, in the racially divided uh, colonial period, these theatres were mostly attended by white theatre goers, of course, who wanted the same kind of entertainment uh, that they would have um, that would have been available in in Europe. So Cape Town, which had boasted the first theatre building of this kind in South Africa, <coughs> went on to acquire the opera house on on the grand parade uh the the theater royal in burke street and then also and the 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 Tivoli theater which was built on the on the corner of plain and darling street i think that is where um the few god theater now stands today if i'm not mistaken <coughs> so basically um there are some significant people here and we're looking at people like Rose Stodel, the daughter of ha harry Stodel, who built the Tivoli, who described it as um, built in the most um, ornate Baroque style because the Baroque era, this was basically the Baroque era, and this comes through influences in music, in literary customs, and things like that. So basically, this kind of theatre had like decor, had red velvet seats, had four boxes on either side of the stage. The seating was in tiers, you had the stalls, you had the balcony, and you had the gallery, the top section, where people of color would sit, like the, um, not black people though, but um, uh, colored people and Malays who were, who were um, allowed to attend these kind of performances, and they would sit in the gallery. So basically, this theater was built to supply um, audiences with a continuous stream of, of overseas musicals and variety artists musicians, illusionists, and, and music hall performers, such as, I don't know if you know, Marie Lloyd or Little Teach, um, all performed in that sort of uh, performance space. So basically, um, indigenous South African uh, English theater was born here um, and, and performed in this sort of kind of building. Um, but uh, it's important to know that these kind of buildings weren't just in the Cape Town um, period. We are looking at similar theatres such as the um, we're looking at similar theatres such as the <coughs> the Standard Theatre and Cyril's Theatre Royale in Joburg. We're looking at the Opera House in PE. We're looking at Durban Royals um, Theatre um, in Durban. We're looking at companies. With, um, um, uh, we're looking at a Theatre Royale in the Kimberley area as well. What's important to note is that companies from London also toured um, um, these spaces, um, and uh, they brought the latest plays to these spaces. Um, they made good profits and stuff like that. Um, but basically, theatre dried up after World War One, and what happened was these theatre buildings then became demolished and or were demolished, and they were then replaced with cinemas. So the Western theatre tradition established these spaces, um, uh, and there is some sort of continuation of it in today. And a modern day example is Peter Turin's Theatre on the Bay um, in Cape Town, and then also the Monte Casino in Joburg, <coughs> where those um, spaces tend to stage um, um, uh, West End or Broadway performances. And during the apartheid years, Turin produced um, very successful farces that was um, um, played to, to packed audiences. The last kind of space that we will look at is university spaces. And it's very important to consider university spaces. Uh, uh, because universities play a big role in, 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 in education and the continuation of the dramatic form. So basically, universities have been central to the history of South African theatre, partly because they provided training for aspiring actors and directors, but also because uh, they um, 
provided experimental venues where new ideas could be tested. So it should be noted that before in the 1990s, there were about 10 drama schools in the country, <coughs> and eight of them were for white people only, for white students only. With only one uh, drama school that was dedicated to black performances and one uh, to Indians. While many universities um, uh, took in non-white students relatively early on, um, the numbers were limited and it can be said that most black performers before the 1990s received their training either in community theatres or in non-governmental organisations or those performers simply just trained on the job. An example of such institutions are um, the New African Theatre Association, also the Sibiqua Community Theatre. So um, the oldest of these university spaces is the Little Theatre, which is at the University of Cape Town, which is where I am. Um, and it uh, was formed to produce um, experiments um, in production and decor that like-minded, um, that, that likened to, you know, the similar sort of work that was performed in England, America, and Canada, etc. So it was converted into a theatre in 1931. And, um, yeah, it was converted to a theatre in 1931. And uh, it, uh, it, it was headed up by um, Rosalie van Gogh, who was a drama, uh, someone in the drama department at UCT. And she was also a legendary um, actress and teacher. So it was here that the, the National Theatre Organization gave its first performance in 1948. And then later, this theatre was the home uh, of another legendary drama teacher, um, Mavis Taylor, whose work uh, included improvisational techniques and also um, experimentation. I am just looking for the next slide. Give me one second. Okay, so um, yeah, it's still the same slide. The next space that we're looking at is the Rhodes University space and the Rhodes University drama department has several venues which are used extensively um, during um, uh, the National Arts Festival which takes place every year and it's also hosted some important premieres such as the first production of, of Guzman and Lena in 1969. Another theatre space is the University of the Witwatersrand Theatre, which allowed audiences of all races to play there. <coughs> <coughs> but this meant that, um, that it was often chosen as a venue for plays which might have been banned if they had um, been presented in more formal theatre settings. Um, example is Waza Albert, um, the plays of um, Workshop uh, um, 71. We're looking at Masha Maponia's The Hungry Earth, we're also looking at productions by the Jungle Avenue Theatre Company, such as the Sun War Rise for the Workers. And this was created by workers in a Dunlop factory um, and was performed to a wider audience there. What's important to note here is that in 1971, or in 1970 rather, there was a theatre practitioner called Wakam Somi who wrote a play called um, Umbata, or Umabata, which was the a Zulu version of Macbeth, and it used the story of Shaka as a reference point. So he collaborated with Professor Elizabeth Snedden, who was the former head of speech and drama at the University of Kuala Natal, and was the director of that play, who I think was Peter Schultz. And the first production at, was at the Natal University's Open Air Theatre, which is another kind of space. Now, significant is that in 1981, the University of Natal opened a theatre that was dedicated to Elizabeth Snedden, which today is used for both professional and uh, student productions. So that was an overview of university spaces. And, and just as an exploration, you are in this phase of your life where you need to think about what you're doing after school. And because you're doing dramatic arts, I would like to think that perhaps you have a focus in trying to study drama. So as a bit of an act activity for, your, for you, go and research which universities and colleges uh, in South Africa is where you can study drama. Ask yourself what programs do they offer, what do those programs include, and which of them appeal to you. I think this would be a very, very va a valuable um, task for you um, to, uh, to do as research for what you're going to do after school. So um, 
that brings us to the end of today's session. In the next session, I'll still be looking at um, a continuation of theatre spaces. Um, there are a few more kinds of theatre spaces that I want to um, explain to you, but it's a lot of work and I don't want to make these videos very, very long. Um, if you have any questions, please um, like, subscribe um, and comment. I will um, check my email and respond to those questions. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And until next time, goodbye.